بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى وسلم على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه الحمد لله اللهم لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم افتح لنا فتح العارفين وفقنا توفيق الصالحين واحفظنا من الزله ومن الخطا ومن الضلال امين الحمد لله سو so, I'm going to, inshallah, try to get through what I planned on doing. I actually spent yesterday translating this last two chapters because it's, they're so extraordinary and I didn't want to um, just translate them like I'm doing this, which is more um, just extemporaneously. I mean, I've, I've read this book several times, so I, I'm comfortable with it, but... Uh, and I read it with a uh, really solid scholar as well. So, alhamdulillah. Bismillah uh, rahman rahim So he says, Sabab tafawat al-nas. The reason why human beings uh, have tafawat. So tafawat, you know, are differences, dissimilarities. They're, 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 uh, they're basically... Uh, when Allah says you will not see in his creation any tafawut, he, he means the creation is equal in its createdness. So there's, there's no dissimilarities. Everything is equal in its being, that it, that it shares in being. And, and then the, the tameyuz is with the, what he prefers. He prefers some things over other things. But in, in be, it's like it's, we're all equal before the law. It's that concept, I and mean, we should be in a, in, a, in a just government. Everybody should be equal before the law. Uh, but people aren't equal uh, in terms of their merit, in terms of what they do with their lives. Uh, so, so he's going to explain why there's inequality amongst human beings. So he says, Asbabu dharika sab'atu ashya. There's seven reasons for this. The first are the differences in their, the mizaj, in, in, in the composite nature of the person. So if you have a choleric nature, you're going to be more inclined to study than a, somebody with a sanguine nature. So your nature is going to determine certain things. Uh, it, will, it will handicap you in some ways, and then it will give you advantages in the other, because sanguine has advantages over choleric and other things. So he's talking about these humors uh, which, if you want a really interesting modern interpretation of them, because I, they are valid, they might not be um, to the degree that, uh, say, the, uh, uh, Galen understood them, but it was Ibn Sina who introduced a lot of the psychological qualities of the humors. So Galen looked at them from the, the actual fluids that showed up, and it was based on these fluids when people get sick, the different types of sicknesses. In any case, he, so he says, وَاخْتِرَافَ al الْخِلْقَةِ And also the, the difference in their, in their uh, the khilqa could be physiognomy, so it's, it's basically, it could also mean character, but it's really here, he's talking about the actual physiognomy of a person, you know, how, how they're built. Um, وكما أشير إليه في يروى أن الله تعالى لما أراد خرق آدم أمر أن تأخذ قبضة من كل أرض فجاء بنو آدم على قدر طينتها جاء منهم الأحمر والأبيض والأسود والسهل والحزن والطيب والخبيث. So this hadith is very interesting hadith which Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi uh, relates from Abu Musa al ashari He says that when Allah subhanahu wa taala desired to create the Adam. Uh, he commanded that there be a qabda, which is a handful, of from all over the earth. So the children of Adam come based on the the the, the places where that earth was gathered. So he he said, and from that you see red people, white people, black people, easy people. Difficult people, based on the type of dirt, the terrain. Uh, good, good people, tayyib uh, and khabith, people that are very uh, fecund in their in their um, productivity, and other people that aren't, because there's earth that doesn't produce much. 
وإلى نحو هذا إشار الله تعالى بقوله البلد الطيب يخرج نباته بإذن ربه والذي خبث لا يخرج إلا نكدا. So the, a, a, a good place, right? Um, a, a, a good uh, place is like good, uh, that the only thing that will come out of it is good. Right? So, بَلَدَ الطَّيِّبْ يَخْرُجُ نَبَاتُهُ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِ So, it, it produces good uh, agriculture. Whereas a, a place that خَبُثَ that it's, it's not a beneficial place, then nothing comes out of it of any benefit. And then he says, هُوَ الَّذِي يُصُبَرُكُمْ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ كَيْفَ يَشَا He fashions you in your wombs, in the wombs of your mothers, as he, as he pleases. In other words, in terms of you're going to have this genetic material. So, min nutfatan amshaj. So, all that mashij that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al Insan, that's in Surah Al Insan, by the way. So, it says the, the nutfa, which is singular, is, 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 uh, is amshaj, which is plural. This is very unusual in Arabic to have this. It's, it's considered an ishkad by the commentators. But it's because the nutfa is made of DNA from all of your female ancestor, from all the, the uh, maternal side, all the way back to Adam, and then from all the maternal side, all the way back to Adam. And the Prophet said in, in a hadith in Imam Ahmad's Musnad, he said that all of a person's ancestors participate in his coming into being, from Adam all the way down to your parents. So this, I mean, this is really extraordinary knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ was, was given about all these different things. And so that's the, that's, that's, that's the first reason he gives. And we would call that today genetics. So people differ based on their genetic background. And we don't choose that. We can't choose that. There's people that have really good genes. We say, oh, he's got good genes. And then there's people that really suffer a lot uh, because of weak genes. Um, so that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does whatever Allah pleases and we should be grateful with, with what we were given but um, that is a, con a consideration you should have compassion for people you know it gives you more reason if, especially if you're healthy although there are reasons uh, on, in, on the Yom Qiyamah the healthy people actually envy all the sick people <laughs> uh. دنيا. والثاني اختلاف أحوال الوالد الوالدين في الصلاح والفساد. The second is the house you grew up in. It's the quality of your parents, from their righteousness or their corrupted nature. So if you grew up in a corrupt house, it's going to have a huge impact on you. And that's why the sin of righteous children of children from righteous parents is worse with Allah than the sin of children who come out of a bad house. If, if you had righteous parents that raised you properly and then you go against that, no excuse with God. Whereas somebody who grew up in an environment where they weren't raised with proper understanding, then there's more uh, wiggle room there. So then he's, he says, so, ذلك أن الإنسان قد يرث من أبويه آثار ما هما عليه من جميل السيرة. He could inherit from the parents also. So not only is there the just growing up in the house, but there's also a kind of wiratha. And you see this in I saw this very clear in Mauritania. It's well known that 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 so many of the righteous um, scholars, their sons uh, have have that quality, even in memory and ability to learn and things like this. So you'll see this. So that's a really interesting uh, point that he's making. Uh, 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 from good character and also bad character. Just as they will inherit the resemblance in their, in their physiognomy. So you see, oh, that he looks just like his dad or he looks just like his... She looks just like her mother, or she looks just like her father, right? It's like George Bernard Shaw. Um, a very beautiful woman proposed to him, and she said, just think of our children. 
you know, with your brains and my looks. He said, my concern would be if they got my looks and your brains. <laughs> and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa ta'ala, wa kana abuhuma saliha. Their father was righteous. That was the seventh grandfather, according to the tafsir. So because that, that man was righteous, Allah wanted good for the children. Now there's a, there's a what's called mafuman mukhalafa, which he gets into. So, yeah, here. وَعَلَى نَحْوِهِ رُوِيَ أَنُّهُ قَارَ فِي التَّوْرَى إِنِّي إِذَا رَضِيتُ بَارَكْتُ إِنْ بَرَكَةِ لَا تَبْرِغُ الْبَطَنَ السَّابِعِ so it's written in the Torah, and the Prophet said, Hadithu an Bani Israel wa la haraj. You can quote the Bible and not feel any uh, difficulty in that. The Prophet permitted quoting the Bible. So he said, It's said in the Torah that I, um, if I'm pleased, I bless, and my blessing will reach the seventh generation. But if I'm angry, then they get the la'na. And my la'nat, la'nati, which is, is the, you know, it's that, that, that good is, is not wanted for them. That will reach the seventh generation. Tanbihan ala anna al khayra wa sharra alladhi yaktisibu al insana wa yatakhalaqu bihi yabqa atharuhu mawruthan. So this is important. It's not the sin because we know la taziru wa ziratun wa zira ukhra. No soul bears the sins of another soul, but the effects of the sins. So the effects of the sins are inherited. And this is why a lot of what's happening in the Muslim world are for things that were done a hundred years ago. Many of the problems, the betrayal that happened. Uh, but th these are the children that have to, uh, to bear the burden of the effects of those sins. The alliances that were made, the treacheries, the betrayals. All these things that happened. The fifth column. There were all these fifth columns in the Muslim world that enabled the colonialists to do what they did. So these are all problems. So that's the... Um, the and also the, the Torah says also that the, you know, a son is not. It has the same. Because that's the... في صحف إبراهيم لا تزروا no soul bears the sins of another. The Prophet said that the, 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 the illegitimate child, Ibn Zina, I mean, they don't even use that word anymore. I don't know what they say now, child born out of wedlock. They don't even, I don't, I don't, these aren't even acceptable terms today, I don't think. But, you know, what's traditionally called Ibn Haram, which is the child of an unsanctified um, alliance. That child, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يحمل من وزر أبويهما شيء. Like he does not carry the sin of the two, nothing of the sin of the two parents. But he gets the effects of the sin. They're, it's makruh for them to lead the prayer, even if they become scholars. You know, so these these are the effects of the sin. But that person him or herself does not have the sin. And now we have, people are going to come into Islam who don't have, you know, lineage or parents. One of the things Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayyah told me, which I think is the proper thing, he said, if their parents were in a common law, like it wasn't just, you know, if, if, if they know their father and, and they were in a common law relationship, he said, we should consider them of lineage. Yeah, because it's become like an orf in, in the culture. So this وَالثَّارِثُ اِخْتِرَافُ مَا تَتَكَوُّنُ مِنْهُ النُطْفَةِ الَّتِي يَتَكَوُّنُ مِنْهَ الْوَرَدُ وَدَمُ الطَّمْثِ الَّذِي يَتَرَبَّ بِهِ الْوَرَدُ So the next one is the nutrition of the mother. So the type of nutrition that she was getting. And we know now that even IQs are less. You know, for people that have malnutrition is a major cause of, uh, of problems, of developmental problems in the children. So, so the, the healthy woman is very important. So choose where you, 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 you plant your seed because it's going to have an effect. So the womb is very important, the type of womb. 
that will carry the seed. But the seed also. The one who mates is a farmer. So look where one of you plants his seed. And the Prophet ﷺ also said, That the beware of the uh, it's it's uh, the khadra is something green and beautiful like a foliage that's beautiful but dimen is a bad source so it's saying a, a, you know somebody could be really you could be very attracted to them they're very charming but look at their home what what type of house they came from because that will have a lot to do with the type of character they're going to have and how they're going to behave so those are very important uh, so he said, it's a, it's a beautiful woman in a, from a bad home. Uh, sorry. So that, I think then, he's saying it's that, that one, the third one, is going to be more the, the, the genetics. Um, yeah, because the fourth one he's, is the actual nutrition. So I think that would go with the first one, just from a different perspective. He's looking at the, you know, the, the, the quality of the mother in particular. And then this one, So the Prophet ﷺ said, wet nursing will change the character. And, and there's a hadith, watch out for the, uh, the, the, the um, simpleton a wet nurse because, because she's giving more than... And we know there's a, there's a study that was done uh, by the Israelis actually about just the quality of yeah, the breast milk and the, year, the time. So up to a year, there was actually... Uh, the, the intelligence was higher in the child if they got breast milk for up to a year. After that, they said it was negligible, the difference. But they did a, a, a broad study on this, on the importance of breast milk in terms of, uh, of intelligence. And so the fifth is the um, is is the how they're actually uh, disciplined and and what they're taught and also what they're naturalized into uh, from ha habits so good habits or bad habits the the right of the child uh, from the parent is that they give them the adab of the sharia and to constantly bring remind ikhtar al haqi like to bring to his mind al haq the truth reality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the deen or all the things that are important and to to habituate the child to doing good because virtue begins as a habit you you habituate and that's why the prophet said for instance a man came to him can yashtaki qasawat qalbihi like he said I, I find a hardness in my heart he said go find orphans and and like pat them on the head right imsah and feed poor people. Because by, by habituating yourself to acts of kindness, it's going to have an impact on the heart. So whenever you habituate yourself to things, it's going to benefit. So, so that's what he's saying. To, to, to. And, then he, and this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Tell your, 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 command them to prayer at seven, but discipline them in doing it at ten. So before 10, there's, there's no discipline. You just tell them, go pray. And if they pray, they pray. And if they keep playing, just leave them alone. But once they get to 10, then no, you, there's a, a discipline. And it's obviously not any physical violence. You know, the Prophet did never left a bruise. He never struck a, a woman or a child. But he said, if you do a discipline physically, do not leave a bruise. And, you know, 
I mean, like a spanking is not a bruise, right? If you, if, if you spank, and then that's why there's a lot of flesh there, right? <laughs> it's cushioned for a reason, not just for sitting, but for disciplining children also. You can't do that anymore, I think. So they're trying, it's illegal in some countries. They'll take your kids away, you know, and the, the Bible, spare the rod, spoil the child, that's what they said, the Bible. It says in Proverbs. <laughs> now all these, these kids are in total rebellion. Nothing you can do. And they look at you like with utter brazenness. If you try to like tell these, some of these young kids. I mean, I knew things were, were looking bad. Several years ago, I was in, when I was living in uh, Santa Clara, and, and these kids were out, you know, I put stuff out for, for them, how they have those pickup days. And, and they were just trashing it and breaking glass. And I came outside. They couldn't have been more than 10 or 11. And I said, hey, what are you guys doing? And, and they just, one of them, the leader, you know, there's always a leader. Yeah. He just looked at me and said, so what are you going to do? And when I was stuck, you know, <laughs> like checkmate, man, you know. That's a bad sign, because when I was a kid, if an adult accosted you, I mean, you just, my father told me that he was in, uh, he was in Dartmouth College when he was a young man, and he was, uh, he went to see Robert Frost um, recite poetry, and he said that there was this Dartmouth student there who was totally slouched in his seat, you know, he's like in the front row, and he said Frost came out, you know, and he was, a, he was a crusty guy. I mean, he was known for being, he was a pretty tough guy. But um, he came out, and, and he looked at this man. He said, young man, sit up. And he said the man, my dad said the man just jumped up and just like straight as an arrow. And for the rest of that night, he said, you know, my dad would look over, and the guy was just like, I mean, can you imagine doing that today? You couldn't do that today. They would literally, like, who do you think you are? can do whatever I want. But that was the decorum. And when you lose decorum in a, in a civil society, you lose civility. That's why it's called civil society. We'll just go back to the jungle, right? The law of the jungle. Might makes right. So very important. So then he says, um, company of the children, like the parents have to really, this is still in number five, they really have to be careful about who their children spend time with, because they, he's, he says, uh, they're like wax when they're young. They will take the form of every form that they are um, uh, affected by. And also that they should see praise as a good thing and, and noble, and they should see blame and being humiliated as something they want to avoid. So the child should see these as good things. They should want to be praised. There's a point where hopefully they have to get over that because we, we, then we only want to be praised by Allah. But that's very important for the child to want to do good, uh, to do things that are good. And then he says, uh, uh, And also that he should be made not to desire to be covetous about food. Like always have ethar, that they want to prefer others. Uh, one of the, I was in, uh, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia and, and they... Uh, I have a friend who's in um, advertising, but they, there was an ad for um, pizza, you know, and it was all these Saudi uh, young men w with their rotara and, 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 and there's only one piece of pizza left and they're all going for it, right? And that was the ad, which is, t that, you know, that was obviously done by somebody that knows nothing about Arabian culture, right? Because how are they going to show? No, that's fadl uh, you, No, you take it. No, you. So they're not going to. They want to add where the food that looks like they don't want it. But that's our culture. That's the Muslim culture. Is that the the last one 
you should offer somebody else. You don't take it for yourself. So that's really important to do that. And then mukharafat al-shahwa, going against their appetites. And also avoiding like silliness and stupidity. Also not uh, sleeping a lot during the day because it becomes a source of laziness. Uh, deliberation wa to deliberate before they uh, do anything or speak and that they shouldn't boast to their to their um, friends about things that they've done all these things uh, gold and silver and وقال بعد الحكماء من سعادة الإنسان يتفق له في سباه من يعوده تعطي الشريعة. And one of the sages said that it's from the felicity of a human being that they find someone when they're young who habituates them to following the Sharia uh, uh, until they actually reach uh, adulthood, uh, and then they know what they're responsible for, and they find that it's consistent with what they had been habituated to, and this will strengthen their inner sight. And be able and be able uh, enable them to fulfill their determination. The sixth one, اختراف ما يتخصص به ويخادطه فيأخذ طريقته فيما يتمذهب به. The sixth one is uh, the difference in what uh, is peculiar to that person, what they uh, you know. What they, what they associate with. So, so those, the, the person that's going to have influence on them and the path that they'll follow. Because human beings by their nature are mimetic. We follow other people. And this is why there, there's a, there was a documentary called the, um, it was called The Merchants of Cool. And it was how there's people that actually go to places to find who the cool people are, and then they market those things. So for instance, like hush puppies, when I was a kid, they had these shoes called hush puppies. Well, it turned out that these cool characters in New York started wearing hush puppies. So they started marketing hush puppies, but then once it becomes common, the cool people don't want to do it anymore because it's not cool. So there's this whole culture of uh, imitating, like it's cool, like, and, and you'll see this, uh, actors have a massive impact on people, uh, Ray-Bans, you know, like glasses, sunglasses that people wear, and uh, even how people talk, they'll imitate, like when James Dean showed up in the 1950s, he changed everything, Marlon Brando, these people had a huge impact on the youth, because they they were they you know they wore T-shirts with rolled up sleeve and people didn't used to do things like that, but once it was popularized and now you have these all these uh, what they call influencers social media influencers that um, that people want to imitate to be like them to be cool but the thing is it's not cool to imitate cool people are cool because they don't imitate, right? And, and so you're just an idiot. So then, if you're going to imitate, who do you imitate? You have to imitate the best of creation. The paragon, the, the, the perfection of God's creation. I mean, I remember at once, uh, somebody said something to Murat al Hajj, and he went, mm, SubhanAllah. And he, and he, he, he just did that. Mm. Like that. And then I saw in Shama'il of Termidi that if the Prophet was, if something surprised him, can he yaqlibu kafahu? He would do that. So he was imitating the best of creation. You don't have to do that. I mean, that's, lovers do that. You'll often find in marriages that the spouse will start doing things that the spouse does. Right? That's very common because it's love and you imitate the one you love. And so when you love the Prophet him, you want to imitate him. So that's very important. Then he says, So don't ask about a man, but ask about the company he keeps. Because that's going to tell you who that man is. The seventh one, This 
The seventh is really important. And this is the difference in human effort in working on themselves with knowledge and action once they become independent. That, that is a huge uh, game changer. Just your own personal effort. And people overcome a lot of those other ones through that last one. Like people will overcome a lot of those previous ones through that. Last. Even physio physiologically, people overcome great. I mean, I'm, I'm not using this as an example, but, uh, well, I am, but um, don't do this. But I, I saw this man who uh, had no hands, but he learned to play piano with his feet. And he could actually play piano with his feet. That's not something, you know, I'm encouraging to do. But the point is, he, overcame, he wanted to learn something, and he overcame an incredible obstacle, which is not to have hands, which you need to play piano. But he showed that actually you could do it with your feet. And there are many examples of that for people that overcome immense um, difficulties uh, physical and otherwise. So, uh, amazing. It's really amazing. This is, uh, you know, one thing I wanted, I'll do this and then I'm going to go to the last um, section. About, this is about, um, this idea of just inheriting problems and the effects of your society on you. So the, the Quran says, Guard yourself against fitan. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Sa'id man junnib al fitan. The real felicitous one is the one who is 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 protected from fitan. So fitna is a it's a comprehensive word. Uh, it's the there's a Greek term for it which is called um, stasis, and Aristotle deals a lot with this in the politics on stasis, which is it, 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 he he considered it a in the way that the body gets ill, societies get ill. So just as you have physical illnesses, societies also have illnesses. And so fitna is a, a social ill. And, and the Prophet ﷺ said that in, in, uh, reported to have said that fitna is sleeping. al fitnatu na'imatun. So may God curse the one who wakes up the fitna. So it's very easy to excite people. It's very easy to cr create fitna uh, because people are very susceptible to it. And, uh, and so there's people that do this. So we're being told to guard ourselves against fitna that doesn't just afflict those who oppress amongst us. And know that Allah is, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهِ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ That He is fierce in retribution. God is fierce in retribution. And then uh, Al -Hatimi say, Imam Al-Hatimi says, وَأَيُّ عُقُوبَةً أَشَدُّ مِنْ عُقُوبَةٍ تَعُمُّ الْمُسْتَحِقَّ بِهَا وَغَيْرَ الْمُسْتَحِقَّ and which punishment is greater than the punishment that afflicts the one who deserves it and the one who doesn't deserve it? The oppressor and the one not oppressing. The innocent one and the one who perpetrated it. This is the nature of the worldly abode that we are in. It is a mixed abode from a nutfa amshaj. فَتَعُمُّ عُقُوبَتُهَا لِعَدَمَ التَّمْيِيزِ The reason that the, it afflicts everyone is because it's a non-discriminatory abode. When the hurricane comes, it doesn't discriminate. When the earthquake comes, so we're in a non-discriminatory abode. The fire gets the whole building. And then he says, but he says, but 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 the akhira, right? Wa hudud al akhira, laysat kadarika, fa inna hadaru tamizin 
فلا تصيب العقوبة إلا أهلها فلو أنها على غير مثال سبق كما أن نشة الدنيا على غير مثال سبق وهو قوله ورقد علمتم النشأة الأولى فلو لا تذكرون So he's saying the afterlife is a dar, a discriminatory abode only the guilty are afflicted in the afterlife not the, 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 uh, the, the, in, uh, the innocent So this is a really important point and then he says He says, فَإِنَّ ظَاهِرَهَا لَا يَقْتَدِيَ الْعَادَلِ وَبَاطِنُهَا يَقْتَدِيَ الْفَضَلِ الْإِلَهِ The outward of this world does not uh, compel us to see it as just, outwardly. But the divine grace is everywhere. And it, and it, and it reveals itself in the afterlife. وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وَزِرَ أُخْرَى no soul bears the sins of another soul. وَهُنَا لَيْسَ كَذَارِكَ فِي عُمُومْ عُقُوبَتِهَا But in this world, it's not. They do bear the sins. The burden of the sins, the effects of the sins, it happens in this world. But, now listen, this is what's really important. وَلَكِنْ مَا هِيَ فِي الْبَرِيْ عُقُوبَةً وَإِنَّمَا هِيَ فِتْنَةً It's not a punishment for the innocent. It's a fitna. وَفِي الظَّالِمْ عُقُوبَ But for the oppressor, it's a punishment. لِأَنَّهَا يَسْتَحِقُّهُ الْكُفَارِ Because they deserve it. And this is why Allah says, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَرَمُوا فَتَمَسَّكُمَ النَّارِ Don't incline towards those who oppress, or you will get afflicted by the fire. وَالنَّبِي جَعَلَ مَوْلَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْهُمْ فِي الْحُكُمْ وَمَا هُمْ مِنْهُمْ فِي نَفْسَ الْأَمَرِ So the Prophet said that the mawla of a people, right, the, the servant of a people is from them, even though in reality they're not. They have the hukam, but in reality they're not. So you can have the hukam of the people that were punished in the world, but in reality you're not one of them. Right? So the adab can come to a people, but they're innocent among them. وَجَعَنَ اللَّهُ مِمَّنْ عَمَرَهُ بِفَضْلِهِ وَنَمْ يَطُّبْ بِوَاجِبِ حَقِّهِ إِذَا قَالَ اللَّهُ فِي حَقِّ مَنَ اصْطَفَاهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ So may, may he make us amongst those who uh, warrant his grace and not those who warrant uh, his punishment. Because he said there are among us people who oppress themselves. حيث حصل الأمان وهذا ظلم المصطفين من عباد الله لا ظلم يتعدى الحدود الإلهية. These are the this is the oppression of the chosen from his servants, not those who actually break the boundaries of God. إنهم ومن يتعدى حدود الله فقد ظلم نفسه لأن لنفسه حدا تقف عنده. الحمد لله. So that's a really useful bit of information to know. So this is the last chapter, and I'm not going to read the Arabic because we don't... What, what, how much time do we have left? It's 5.55. Well, let, let me... Uh, you know, the Arabic is just so stunning. He's such a beautiful writer. And... Uh, hmm... So this is called إثبات المعاد وفضيلة الموت وما تحصل له بعده من السعادة لم ينكر المعاد والنشة الآخرة إلا جماعة من الطبيعيين أهمر أفكارهم وجاهر أقدارهم وشغلهم عن التفكر في مبدأهم ومنتهاهم شغلهم بما زين لهم من حب الشهوات المذكورة في قوله تعالى زين للناس حب الشهوات من النساء والبنين والقناطير المقنطرة من الذهب والفضة والخيل المسومة والأنعام والحرف ذلك متع الحياة الدنيا والله عنده حسن المآب فأما من كان سوريا سويا ولم يمشي مكبا على وجهه لكونه كالأنعام بل هم أضل سبيلا فتأمل أجزاء العالم فتأمل أجزاء العالم علم أن أفضلها ذوات الأرواح وأفضل ذوات الأرواح ذو الإرادة 
والاختيار في هذا العالم وأفضل ذو الإرادة والاختيار الناظر في العواقب وهو الإنسان فيعلم أن النظر في العواقب هو من خاصية الإنسان وأنه تعالى لم يجعل هذه الخاصية له إلا لأمر جعله ذو العقبة وإلا كان وجود هذه القوة فيه باطلة فلو لم تكن للإنسان عاقبة ينتهي إليها غير هذه الحياة الخسيسة المملوءة نصبا وهما وحزنا أو حزنا لا تكون بعده حال مغبوطة لكان أخص الحيوانات أحسن حالا من الإنسان ولكان يقتضي أن تكون هذه الحكم الإلهية والبداية الربانية التي أظهرها الله تعالى في الإنسان عبثا كما نبه الله تعالى عليه بقوله أفحسبتم أنما خرقناكم عبثا وأنكم إلينا لا ترجعون فإن إحكام بنية الإنسان مع كثرة بدائعها وعجائبها ثم نقضها وهدمها من غير معنى سوى ما تشاركه فيه البهائم من الأكل تشاركه فيه البهائم من الأكل والشرب والسفاد مع ما يشبه من التعب الذي قد أعفى الله منه الحيوانات سفهم كالتي نقضت غزرها من بعد قوة أنكاثة تعالى الله عن ذلك علوا كبيرا So I translate because I, you know, I just wanted to get these meanings right. So this is his conclusion. And I, obviously we didn't finish all the chapters. He, he, he goes into some really important aspects about the, the prophetic, um, you know, the, the prophets and how they differ and, 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 and why they're so important. And then guidance. And then he talks about the virtues and the vices and how to overcome the virtues. Uh, the vices and to inculcate the virtues and then those awaqib, those things that prevent people from overcoming their vices so he goes into it's it's i mean this is this book is a roadmap for life um, but he ends it and i think imam al-ghazali allahu alam uh, imam al-ghazali was heavily inspired by this man and i think the fact that imam al-ghazali ends his book Uh, the Ihya with the chapter of death. Uh, I think, I mean, he has 40 books and, and he quotes him considerably. So, so Bismillah, asserting the afterlife and the virtue of death and what follows of bliss. No one denies the resurrection or the second creation other than materialistic naturalists who have neglected their own thoughts and were ignorant of their own worth. Their own passionate desires for what appear to them as good among their appetites preoccupies them from reflection on their source and their end, as is mentioned in God's words. Made to seem pleasing to humanity is love of desires for women and children and heaps and hordes of gold and silver and domesticated horses and cattle and fields, Those are the conveniences for the life of the world, while the finest resort is the presence of God. As for the upright one, who does not walk as if falling on his face due to being like dumb cattle or even more astray, he has reflected on the constituents of the world and realized the best are those that have animate souls. And the best of those with animate souls are the ones possessing volition and free will in this world. Furthermore, the best of those who have volition and choice are those who consider deeply the consequences of matters, and this is the human being. Indeed, Allah did not grant such a particular gift to the human being except for something relegated to the ultimate consequence. If not, then this special gift of the human being would have been meaningless and in vain. The fact that we, are, we always think about the end, and umur bi maqasidiha, this is one of Covey's seven, uh, you know, have the end in mind, right? This is what intelligent people do. But we, this is our deen, we don't need uh, a, a, a corporate consultant to tell us because our deen says, umur bi maqasidiha. And should always be in mind when you do things. So he's saying that this gift that we have of being able to think about the end result of things. Why do we have this gift? Because if it wasn't about the end result of existence and what comes after, 
it would really have, it would, it would be meaningless. Like these materials who say, in the end, it's all meaningless. Is this all just random? We're, we're here due to random. So he says, had the end of human life simply been this miserable life, al khasisa here below, filled with its trials, griefs, stress, and exhaustion. And this is real people, like we're in blessings, but there are people really suffering. You know, if you're in Gaza, this, this rings true. If you're in Yemen right now, this rings true. It might not for some people in some areas of the world, but for many people, this is the reality of their life. It's trials, grief, stress, exhaustion, and with no condition of bliss afterwards. If, if, if we, we have to go through all this suffering and there's no condition of bliss, then the most contemptible animal would be better in their condition than the human being. It would also mean that all of these divine wisdoms and lordly wonders that God has manifested in the human being would be simply without purpose. As God said, do you figure that we have made you in vain and that you would not be returned to us? Surely had the perfection of man's form with all the wonders and marvelous aspects followed by its nullification and destruction been without any meaning other than to share with the other animals, eating, drinking, mating, on top of all the travails that accompany such a life, especially given that God has relieved the other animals of enduring many of these hardships. There's no stressed out animals out. They're not worrying about their 401k. You know, they're not worrying about the fact that their doctor just told them they have uh, cancer, right? They don't have to cook their meals or they, they go out every morning and they find there's, there's squirrels that come to my house every day. They know they're going to get um, cashews. They come and they literally sit there in front of the window like, come on, you guys are late, right? They don't, like, they don't have that stress. The cats, look at them, look at the life. They're just lying around. That, they sleep, they don't, you know, their ears are always a little. So the fact that Allah has, that we have all this endurance and then we'd be better off being animals if this was all meaningless because they don't have all that stress. In that case, human life would be futile. Like she who breaks what she has spun after it's strong into untwisted strands. So this woman who, she, she, she was a woman in Mecca, she was, there's a time of madness where people do this. And she would weave things and then she would unweave them and just do it over and over again. This also I mean, is a famous, um, in, in the Iliad, where, because the, uh, the wife of, um, the wife of Odysseus, she had all these suitors and she was waiting for her husband to come back. So she used to, she said, when I finish my, my weave, um, I'll accept proposals. So she would weave all day and then at night she would unweave it, waiting for her husband to return. So, so, so then he says, transcendent is Allah, ta'ala Allah. Transcendent is God, far above and beyond such thoughts that this is all in vain, all of this. All of these wonders, all of these galaxies, all of these uh, extraordinary creatures that Allah has made, this is all just haphazard, no meaning to it. How clear to anyone willing to throw off the veil of blindness is the veracity of Amir al-Mu'minin, Imam Ali's statement, radiallahu anhu. This world is a temporal abode, not a permanent one, so pass through it and don't attempt permanent residence, for you have been created for eternity. But you must pass from abode to abode until you come to the final resting place. Now, this next section, it's like he wrote it for us today. It's just so extraordinary. Unfortunately, many fools have been duped by people to whom they attribute great intelligence about their worldly affairs. All the while, these people deny any afterlife. 
They declare such statements as, well, if the afterlife was true, such brilliant men and others like them of such extreme intelligence and impeccable understanding, they wouldn't have denied it. So you have all these atheists that write their books, God is not great, right? All, all these, uh, what was the other one Dawkins wrote? Yeah, the God delusion, right? You know, that all these, and they call themselves brights. You know, we're the, we're the smart ones. And, and, they, and then they have these things how, you know, the people with the highest IQs tend to be atheists. And now all these, it's almost, now it's cool to be an atheist. It's uncool to be a believer, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to imitate those. They're cool. So, so this is what, so, so, so this is who they're following, these genius people that have said, oh, this is all just a coincidence, just popped into existence from nothing. And, and all your apparent design, it's just a trick. You've just been fooled by a trick. It's all just a trick. You're not really designed. It just looks like that. It's just hit and miss over billions of years. What they fail to recognize is that intellect, despite being a noble substance, will only investigate those matters to which one directs it to. It has no independence as such, unless willfully directed to something. Hence, if it finds direction to immaterial matters of the afterlife, it will master such matters. But if it is directed only toward the material affairs of this material world, it becomes formidable in such matters and fully embraces them to the neglect of everything else. So they become great biologists and great mathematicians and, and great right, politicians because that's where they've directed their intellect to. And they've neglected. And that's why he says, Ahmalu afkarahum. Right? They neglected their own thoughts. They didn't direct their thoughts to think deeply about the world and their condition in the world. This results in the inner eyes blindness. The basira goes blind. It's not, Allah says it's not the, the, the eye that goes blind. It's the hearts that go blind. This results in the inner eye's blindness concerning metaphysical matters of eschatology. In other words, what's coming after. One can find many examples of this in the Quran, as we mentioned earlier. Section on death as a door to paradise. Know that death as we know it, which is the separation of the soul from the body, is a means by which a person achieves eternal bliss. It is a transfer from one abode to another, just as was stated. Surely you are created for eternity, but you must transfer from one abode to another until you rest in the final abode. Hence, although outwardly death means annihilation and effanescence, in reality it means a renaissance, a second birth. How excellent is this conveyed in the meaning of the poet when he said, the, the birth pangs of death came to him one day and every pregnancy must complete its term. His conceit, the poetic conceit, was to make death akin to the pregnancy of a woman. The pangs of death, like the pangs of childbirth, and being born into another world, like the first birth, as a way of reminding us that this is one of the very purposes for existence itself. I had this idea, because I saw, I saw this little um, cartoon of two, two twins in the womb, and, and one says to the other, do you believe in mom? And, and, the, and the other one says, what's the proof for mom? He said, well, where'd this womb come from? He's like, ah, it was always here. <laughs> uh, so I had an idea for like a, a computer generated conversation of these like twins, you know, that they actually are having this thing. But then the, the, the birth comes, and they're like, oh, what's happening? You know, and then they come out into the world and they're like crying. And then the next scene is the two of them in a car as twins, adults. And they're like, do you believe in God? Ah, what's the proof of God? And then, <laughs> and then they have a car crash.
So he says, being born into another world like the first birth as a way of reminding us that this is one of the very purposes for existence itself. One of the sages said, as long as man is in this world dwelling in his body, he is analogous to a chick within the egg. Just as the chick must break through the egg to be born, so a man, in order to find completeness, leave his body. Indeed, had it not been for death, the human being could never achieve wholeness. Hence, death is essential for the completion of one's humanity. In fact, given that death acts as the means by which one moves from this lower state to a nobler, more exalted one in the next life, God has called it Tawafian, Tawafahu Allah, Tawafia, because it, the, it's, the, it's the fulfillment. You know, Yefi Bidenihi, he fulfilled his debt. So Tawafa is to make you fulfilled. It's to bring you into your completeness. O Imsakan, to hold, to divinely take that person unto himself. God takes souls as their death or in their sleep if they aren't dead, keeping those sentenced to death and sending the rest to definite terms. Surely these are signs for people who reflect. For that reason, we find such expressions as Tawafahu Allah or Lahiqa Billah. He went back to God and many such idioms. Given that death means a movement from a lower abode to a higher one, he or she who trusts God loves death. Indeed, only two types of people detest death. Those who do not believe in an afterlife. So the only pleasure to be found is here in this world. God describes them. You will find them indeed the most eager of people for life. Ashaddu nas. Right? The harasana al al they, 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 they have this intense, uh, you know, they want to live like a thousand years. Each one of them wishes he could live for a thousand years. But to be granted a long life will not distance him from retribution, for God sees what they do. One of the poets among this ilk, so one of these uh, materialists, he said, أَتَتْرُكُ لَدَّةَ صَحْبَاءِ نَقْدَ بِمَا وَعَدُوكَ مِنْ لَبَنٍ وَخَمْرِ So this is a man trying to seduce a woman. This is one of the, you know, they call them the Sha'ir majin, you know, majuna sha'ir. Do you leave the pleasure of wine here for some promise about milk and wine there? Hayatun tum mautun tum hashrun. Hadithu khurafatan ya umma'amun. Life, death, resurrection. These are just myth mythology, just superstition. Khurafa, the Prophet Zahisim, said that Khurafa, you know have they have, what they have, alien abduction? Do you know about that? You heard of that? Never heard of that? Alien abduction? You never heard of alien abduction? Dehya, have you heard of alien? You have? Yeah. You know what it is? It's jinn. These poor people, they get abducted by jinn and they have these experiences and and then they come back and nobody believes them. And that's what happened to Khurafa. The Prophet ﷺ said Khurafa was a man who was kidnapped by the jinn. And he took them to Abqar and he saw all these amazing things. He came back and he said, oh, I went to Abqar. And, and they, everybody just said, Hadith Khurafa. It is made up. So that's what he's saying the afterlife is. Ya Umma Amir. And then another one said, Khud min dunya bihadlin qabra an tunqara anha. Take from this world a good portion before you, you have to leave it. Because you'll find no abode after this better than this. So these are the materials. So he's saying, these people hate death. So then he says, So the second type are people who believe in the afterlife, but they're, they're worried about their sinfulness. So those who believe but are fearful concerning their sinfulness. Anyone without those two concerns will love death and look forward to it, just as the righteous love death and look forward to it. Hence, the Prophet said, those who love to meet God, God loves to meet them. This is a mutafaqan alayhi, it's in a Bukhari and Muslim. So he says, 
if you if you love to meet God, God loves to meet you. And and for this reason, God says, desire death if you are sincere. Right? Tamanno al mot. He says this to Bani Israel for making their claims that they're the chosen people and this and that. He says, Okay, desire death if you're really sincere about that. So this is important because the Prophet said, You know, none of you should desire death. Um, and he said, if you have to, then you say, So, Oh, don't desire death, but if you have to say something, especially min min asabahu darar, you know that any any harm that came to him. But he said, if you have to, then just say, Oh Allah, give me death as uh, give me life as long as it's good for me, and and take me, uh, give me death if death is better for me. And the, but the Prophet did say after five prayers a day, uh, he used to say. Uh, he would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when aratabin nasi fitnatan, faqbidni ireka ghayra maftun. If you want, if there's going to be calamity, civil strife, if, if, if there's going to be like what's happening in Sudan right now, may Allah bring them back to their senses. You know, if you have a situation like that, then he, the Prophet asked to just go back to God. Especially Muslims fighting each other in Ramadan, like really? Really? What's happened to us? Where's your uqud? Where's the reason? You're all brothers. Allah made you brothers. He, you were on the pits and he saved you from that pit. You know, he told us to cling to the rope of Allah. You know, don't go into sectarianism. Over dunya? Over politics? Really? This is worth fighting over, dunya. It doesn't equal a gnat's wing with God. This whole abode, it doesn't equal a gnat's wing with God in relation to what Allah has in, in the next world. We're in dunya. This is the lowest place, dunya. And it's not that we don't honor. No, we do. We honor the, the apotheosis. We honor this incredible display of divine, but dunya, this life of this world, politics and who's in and who's out and who's in power and who's not, all of that doesn't equal a gnat's wing with God. The life of this world, all the palaces, all of the dunya, it's nothing, just empty. So, so Shah Wali Allah said, that one of the meanings of this hadith, because Aisha actually, when the Prophet mentioned this, Aisha said, Kulu nakar hal maut, ya Rasulullah. All of us don't like death. Like, it, you know, it troubled her. Well, you have an instinct for life. I mean, this is, Allah has given you a great instinct for life. And that instinct is there for a reason. Like we, w and even the body is designed to protect. If if you once you get into anatomy and physiology and study, and you know, I was a critical care nurse. When you, when you actually study what happens when when people are in uh, deep physiological distress, the body. People get shot 10 times and they survive, and that's only because the body does all of these things to protect life. Right? It, it's amazing what it'll do. It'll vasoconstriction to stop the blood from, from spilling out, all these things. So he's not saying that um, we have to honor the gift of life, but we have to recognize the gift of death. And, and one of the things the Prophet said, said in the hadith, he said about the latter days, he said, that the time is coming when the nations, and he meant al Yahud wa Nasara. I mean, it's very clear, because he said, Woman and Nasilaha Ula. He said, The Christians and the Jews will gobble you up like uh, diners come to a plate, they'll just gobble up all your natural resources. Are we, what's our, 
It's very interesting that the Sahabi did not say Amin Katharatihim. He didn't ask about them. He wasn't interested in why, why they were able to do it. He wanted to know what's wrong with us. Because that's, that's the only thing you can fix. You can't fix them. So he, he, it's a brilliant question. But, but it was logistical. It wasn't the spiritual. He was looking at the material. He was looking at the logistics of it. No, your multitudes. It's not lack of numbers. It's not your problem. But you're like froth. You're insubstantial. Like, like the flood that brings up all that foam. You reach out, there's nothing there. And he said that the, the, the awe, the mahaba that the people had for you as a, as a civilization will be lost because they were in awe of us. They had great fear of the Muslims. They were in awe of the Muslims. He said, that will be gone. All that awe will be gone. And you will find in your hearts wahan. Uh, they said, what's wahan, Ya Rasulullah? Because wahan in Arabic means weak. But they want to know what, what, what's the weakness? Materialism and detesting death. So that's what he's talking about, is that once you recognize the gift of death, you should want a long life. The Prophet asked for a long life. The Prophet gave us things to increase life. Bir al-walidain. He said, bir al-walidain yuzidu fil umar. Being good to your parents, filial piety, will actually increase your life. The Prophet said, let none of you desire death. He said, you're either somebody who's got sin that you need to, to do good to wipe it out, or you're doing good and you can add more and have a higher maqam in the afterlife. So that's so it's important that you understand that this, but this is what he's saying is so important because the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Motu Tuhfat al Mu'man. Death is the precious gift of the believer. Al Motu Tuhfat al Mu'man. It is the precious gift. Of the believer. It's a gift. It's not something. So then he said, So this is this to me is one of the most extraordinary sections here, also. It's a door from the doors of paradise. Death is among the doors that open paradise. Through it, one arrives to heaven. Had it not been for death, heaven would have been inaccessible. For that reason, God granted us death as an access to life. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتُ وَرْحَيَاتَ لِيَبْرُوكُمْ أَيُّكُمُ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That he created death and life. Why did he say death first? Because death is the door to life, the real life. He created death and the afterlife. Al-hayat al-haqiqiyya, the real life. فَقَدَّمَ ذِكْرَ الْمَوْتَ عَلَى الْحَيَاتِ تَنْبِيهًا عَلَى أَنَّهُ يُتَوَصُّرُ بِهِ إِلَى حَيَاتَ الْحَقِقِيَّةَ ثُمَّ وَعَدُّهُ عَنَيْنَ مِنْ نِعْمِهِ فَقَالَ كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا فَأَحْيَاكُمْ ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ ثُمَّ يُحْيِيكُمْ ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ تَرْجِعُونَ So then he says, in another verse, God mentions it among the blessings that he has bestowed upon us. How can you deny God when, when you are dead and God gave you life? Then God will cause you to die and then revive you and then you will be returned to God. So here, when he says, كَيْفَ takfurun billah, Kufar essentially means ingratitude. Here it means how, how can you deny God, but you're denying which of the bounties of your Lord are you denying? So this is a denial of the gifts that God's given us. So what are those gifts? He brought you to life. Then he causes you to die. Then he brings you back to life and you will be returned to him. So death is among the gifts that he's telling us to be aware of. 
then God will cause you to die and then revive and then return. Hence, God made death a blessing just as life was made a blessing, simply given as one cannot achieve the bliss of the afterlife without passing through the door of death. Death becomes a blessing as the means to a blessing is also a blessing. Because death is the means that enables the greatest happiness, the prophets and the sages have never feared it. In fact, the prince of the believers, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, I swear by God, I couldn't care less whether I fall upon death or death falls upon me. They saw themselves as if they were in prison, waiting for the good news of a reprieve. For this reason, the Prophet ﷺ said, A dunya sijin mu'min wa jannatul kafir. This world is a prison for the believer and a paradise for the scoffer. It is said that when Dawud al Ta'i, he's one of the early great, great, uh, Imam al Qushayri has a beautiful, um, he's one of the Zuhad. And, and it's said that he, he, he was kind of a bit aimless and, and he used to walk around Baghdad. And there was this man, Hamid al Ta'i, who was a uh, was, um, very uh, wealthy man. He had bodyguards. And, and one day he was walking, and his bodyguard just knocked him out of the way. And, uh, and he said, this is, a, this is an unworthy abode, you know, if, if this is the type of person that, you know, rules this world. Like, he didn't have any. And so he became a Zahid. And, and uh, he, he was amongst, uh, you know, that early period. Amazing man. So when he died, uh, he said, people heard a voice that said, Dawood has been released from prison. وَقَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لَإِن مُتُّمْ أَوْ قُتِلْتُمْ لَا إِلَى اللَّهِ تُحْشَرُونَ If you die or you are killed, you will be returned to God. It will be gathered before God. Tambihan ala an al maut sabirun ila hayat al mustafatati and Allah. It's and this is an indication that uh, that death provides the path to salvation with God. Again, God says Lain Kutum fi Sabiri Lahi O Mutum La Magfiratum Mina Lahi Warahma Khairum Mimma Yajmaun. So if you are killed for the sake of God or die, surely forgiveness from God and mercy are better than what others amass. Another verse states Wada Tahsi Banna Lao Tahsabanna Ladina Kutiru fi Sabiri Lahi Amwata Barahia Una and the Rabbi him your Zakon. فَرِحِينَ بِمَا تَاهُمَ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَيَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ أَلَّا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and do not consider those killed in God's cause to be dead. No, they are alive, being supported in, in the presence of their Lord, rejoicing in what God has given them from the, bount, from the divine bounty, and they rejoice for those who have not joined them yet, that they will have no burden of fear and they do not sorrow. Based upon this, now this is, this is it. Based upon this, God reminds us with these words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ خَرَقْنَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُرَارَةٍ مِنْ طِينٍ ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُطْفَةً فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينٍ ثُمَّ خَرَقْنَا النُطْفَةَ عَلَقَةً فَخَرَقْنَا الْعَلَقَةَ مُضْغَةً فَخَرَقْنَا الْمُضْغَةَ عِظَامًا فَكَسَوْنَا الْعِظَامَ لَحْمَ ثُمَّ أَنْشَأْنَاهُ خَرْقًا آخَرَ فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَارِقِينَ ثم إنكم بعد ذلك لميتون ثم إنكم يوم القيامة تبعثون. So this is in Mu'minun, the chapter of the believers. So listen to what he says about this. First of all, it's very interesting. If you look at these verses, there are a lot of huruf mufakhama. There's a lot of uh, the halq letters. It's, it's a heavy verse to read. It's not, it's not a light verse. It's like this is creation. And that's why you know, one of the gifts of tajweed is that it actually is a type of tafsir. You know, makharj al-huruf. Like there's, there's, taf there's tafsir in the, the actual letters that God uses in the Quran. 
As you can see, those are walaqad khalaqana al-insana min suladat min tin. I mean, these are heavy uh, letters. You know, this is Allah's creation. Nutfa qarar khalaqna nutfa alaqa khalaqna alaqa. It's all there. Mudga fa khalaqna. I mean, this is it's a weighty thing. Your creation is a weighty thing. Nine months. Nine months, not to mention, you know, going back generations and generations in your preparation, because Allah knew each one of your parents had to survive childhood illnesses, had to survive pregnancies, had to wars, famines, all sicknesses, all these things, each one, any point in that. If one died, you wouldn't be here. But Allah brought you into existence. It's a weighty thing. It's a heavy thing. So Allah uses heavy letters to talk about this coming into existence. يعده من لا يتصور مآله وحاله فساده فالنفس لا تحب البقاء في هذه الدار إلا إذا كانت قذرة راضية بالعراضة الدنيوية رضا الجعل بالحش أو تكون جاهلة بحالها في المآل It's incredible uh, istimbat here So he says And we created the human being from an extract of earth, then placed it as a drop in a secure repository, then made the drop a clot or a clinging thing. Then we made the clinging thing a lump of flesh. Then we made the flesh bones. Then we clothed the bones with flesh. We produced another creature from it. So blessed is Allah, best of creators. And as for you, same ayah, after that you are going to die. And then you will, on the day of resurrection, be raised up. Now look at what he says. Look at what he takes from this. Allah calls to our attention that each stage of transformation was toward a better creation. Thus, Allah will destroy this temporal body in order to restore it to a higher, more noble form, like the date seed that is planted, which can only become a great fruit-bearing date palm through the destruction of its form. Look at the wheat grain. We can only use it to support our bodies by crushing it, then kneading it, and then baking it, and finally eating it. Thus, outwardly, each stage appears to be its destruction, when in reality, it is being prepared for its final purpose. Look at the seed. It is thrown upon the earth and buried. So one seeing that, who does not know what it is to become, would deem such an act wasteful. As for the soul, it does not want to remain in this abode unless it is defiled content with the inconsequential stuff of this world, like a dung beetle, content. And the word he uses is, is basically like a shite hole. The dunya, that's what it is. Or else someone who is a complete ignoramus concerning the state of the soul in the afterlife. As aforementioned, people are of two types. Those who have gained nothing from humanity except the outward form of upright stature, wide fingernails, risibility, and vacuous speech analogous to whistling and clapping. These are lower than beasts. And then those who can be called human beings. These are the ones for which humanity was created. Given such a situation, there are only two states we find ourselves in. The first is our worldly state which is of those who have not set out on the steep ascent or freed the slave. Rather, they are victims of hunger and prisoners of satiety. Their sweat engenders a stench. Bed bugs irritate them. They can die choking on a morsel of food. But no, he has not fulfilled the commandment of God. Such a person, as long as he resides in the world, cannot be considered better than the angels ever. The second condition 
is that of one who rushes the steep ascent, frees the slave, and after fulfilling what Allah has commanded of him, thus becoming among those who have no fear, nor do they grieve. Indeed, they have achieved a seat of truth in the presence of an omnipotent sovereign. That of life without annihilation, richness without want, dignity without denigration, and knowledge without ignorance. The angels come to their service, just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised, everlasting gardens where they will enter and upright ones among their parents, their spouses, and their children, and the angels enter their presence from every gateway. Salaamu alaykum, peace be upon you, for you were constant, and how excellent the final abode. At this point, the one who has achieved his status is more virtuous than many of the angels, and Allah knows best. And then he makes this dua, and one of the great blessings of our scholars is that they make du'as in their books, and we know that the righteous, their du'as are answered, so we get to hear his du'a, and then say ameen. So it's, it's, this is a great blessing of our tradition, is that these people made du'a for people that read their books after them. So he said, May Allah help us to achieve this station. And make us from those who are worthy of it. With his mercy. He's capable of all things. And then he says, برحمته إنه على ما يشاء قدير والحمد لله وصلواته على خير خرقه محمد وآل الطيبين الطاهرين آمين الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله تفضل So all these tribulations, you know, they're just, there's, there's a hadith the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has decreed for some people a manzila with him, what he's talking about, this station with him, but because they don't make the efforts to achieve it, he gives them tribulation in their bodies and, and, and in their mental states. Imam al-Ghazali said that the depression is one of the ways in which God removes all their sins. People leave the world with, with, sinless through tribulation. The Prophet ﷺ said, when, when, when people see on the day of judgment what the people who had bodily suffering in this world, he said they wish they were, they could go back to the dunya and have themselves cut with scissors, maqarir, qita'tan, qita'tan, to get the, the, the reward of what those people get in the afterlife. This is our deen, it's not, you know, people think these things were just made up to assuage people. Well, first of all, why would you make up hell? That's not very comforting. <laughs> right? I mean, if I, if I was going to make it, I would just put them in prison for a while or something and maybe have them tortured. But eternal? SubhanAllah. It's not very comforting. So these, these the Prophet ﷺ, what he said is true. And people, the thing about the Qur'an is... If people are willing to just look at this book, if they're willing to look at this book, and there's all these different types of miracles in the Quran. There's rhetorical miracles, there's grammatical miracles, there, there's, there's the miracles of, of the letters, the muqatta'at. I mean, they're miraculous, those letters. There's miracles of the meanings of the Quran. There's things in the, in that embryology, nobody could have known that. Even Keith Moore said this is the earliest accurate description of embryology. And in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah gives two proofs for, uh, for the afterlife. The first is an embryological proof. That's the proof for the people of the latter days because the, the Salaf couldn't have known that. We know it now. But the second proof is that he brings he brings dead earth back to life. Look at it, California. Just look, at, uh, have you seen like this dead earth from a drought of years? And we're like, it's like Ireland. There's, there's, there's poppy blooms that can be seen from outer space. 
flowers, like flowers. And, th and that's the, the weeds come, but the flowers come too, and that's the afterlife. The, the weeds are going to be revived, and, and then with flowers. We're, we're in a cocoon, people. We're in a cocoon. We're all caterpillars. And, 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 and death is, is breaking out of that cocoon to become a butterfly, this beautiful, perfected creature. And the work is here in the cocoon. You have to do the work, even bursting forth out of the cocoon. The, the, the butterfly, actually, the wings are strengthened by the effort that it gives in breaking out. If you, if you open the cocoon too early, the wings are not developed. It can't fly. And that's why we need time. Allah's given us enough time to work on our souls. It, it should take about 50 years. That's what Ibn al-Munkandir said. I mean, he, he was probably maybe a little longer. But the Taoists, very interestingly, say that one of the reasons life extension is so important in Taoism is because they say that it takes a long time to perfect the soul. And so you should take care of yourself so that you, you, that you live long enough. You don't want to die before you're ready to, to go. But the beauty of our religion is that if you're seriously in this journey, even if you're trying to memorize the Quran, that's why everybody should have a niyyah to memorize the Quran. If you're trying to memorize and do something, there, the angel will come and, and finish it in the grave if you didn't get to finish it in this world and you're raised up with the hufal. So, so your incompleted works will be completed by God. I mean, this is, it's all bounty. Allah's generosity is so immense. And, and asking very little, just hamd. You know, there's the, the Prophet Sallallahu said, if, if, if somebody, if Allah takes their safi, you know, like their beloved, like you lose your spouse or your child, usually it's a child because these are very difficult for parents. But if you lose somebody truly beloved to you, Allah tells the angels, and he knows better, to what did they say? And they say, and it says, hamidaka was starja. They, they, they said, alhamdulillah, inna lillahi wa inna illahi raji'un. And Allah says, build for them a house in paradise. And he calls it Bayt al-Hamd, the house of praise. Yeah. So when people die, I feel like saying congratulations. Like people want ta'ziyah, you know, but I swear to God, I really feel in my heart, I just want to say how, how lucky, how fortunate they're out of this place. Yeah, what a blessing, you know. And we should love life, and I'm not in any way, we don't, the cult of death is a perversion of this teaching, like this ISIS type, this cult of death. It's a perversion of this teaching. You know, this idea that, oh, we just, you know, suicide bombing, just blow ourselves up. A'udhu billah. The Prophet, first of all, prohibited mutilation of bodies. And what greater mutilation than to blow yourself up? I mean, how could that be a prophetic teaching? And my teacher in Mauritania just thought it was completely, and they're pre-modern. The teachers I studied with had no, no experience of modern Muslim thought. Marab Tarhaj, all the, every book he read was, you know, there was no, I mean, the oldest book he had, he had a book uh, that had an introduction by uh, an Egyptian scholar from about 120 years ago. But he didn't have any modern books. And I remember giving him an article from uh, a newspaper, and, and he read it, and he asked me what language it was. So I said, it's Arabic. He said, mm. They said, Al-Arabi li arafu I said, it's not the Arabic I know. Yeah. And he, he did a commentary, uh, over a thousand pages, on the al of Ibn Malik, and did Sharh of uh, all the mu'alaqat, the jahali poetry, everything. So, but he, they, they just did not see that as from Islam. And the first suicide bombers were, were um, actually Hindus. And then the kamikaze, the Japanese. And those poor guys, they were actually, they locked them in the planes. They couldn't, they gave them only enough fuel to, you know. So they couldn't, they couldn't land the planes. Yeah, it wasn't like voluntary. Yeah. But it's also an act of desperation. One has to come to terms with that. 
because even the kamikaze, they didn't do it at the beginning of the war. That was at, it was at the end of the war. It's kind of an admittance that they've lost. Well, I'll make it easy for the people there, you know, in these different places. But um, I think the modern ulama that have opened up these doors, you know, and now they can't close them because now they blow up Muslims, right? In Pakistan, they go into a Shia mosque and stuff at Allah. Amazing. I like they're good, doing a good deed. The Prophet called them kirab al nar You know, these type, he called them, yeah, dogs of hell. I'm doing that. Anyway, Tafadal. Imam Rawi, he talks. Imam more referring to like the actual moment that yeah he, he's taught well one of the things Shah Wali Allah says is that at the moment of death you will a lot of openings will happen that's why martyrs the Prophet said the only person that wants to come back to the world in order to die again and again is the martyr because of the experience of death what happens at that moment it's so incredible so so that that is uh Shah Wali Allah says all these openings will happen at that moment. Like you will see paradise and you will see angels and you will see these things. And, and that's why Man Ahaballahu Liqa'ahu, it's he said that he, he interpreted that to be at the moment of death. What Aisha radiallahu was talking about was Kuluna Nakarahul Maut. In other words, it's a natural thing to, to dislike death. None of us, I mean, we're, are, we're designed to avoid. Um, these things, like we'll, you know, I mean, courage is a very interesting thing because courage, a courageous person, will do things that in which they can get killed, but they do it for a there's a there's a a goal behind it. It's not nihilistic like a lot of the violence today. The, today the violence is nihilistic. It has no real purpose. It's just to inflict pain on others, but you're not achieving any victories by it. And then it becomes nihilistic. Whereas the, the courageous one will know when it's proper to do that and when it's not. So, so everybody, that, that, that point is, is well taken. But Chef, I was wondering more of like the, maybe there's a connection to uh, Maulana Rumi because he mentions like this idea of dying before. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to, uh, I think I had it here. I was going to, yeah, that, I was going to recite that. Because Rumi, uh, and I don't know if he got this, he probably had read Raghib, uh, but uh, he was a great inspired poet. So when he's talking about this, this is not evolution. It's the fact that we were mi mineral, and, and then we became v vegetable, and then we became animal. So that, those are the stages of creation. Because, you know, y your body is, comes from the earth. So that's the mineral phase. But then, and then you go into the vegetative, which is the growth and nutrition. And then you go into the animal, which is sentience, feeling. And then you become human. It's a different type of creation. So he says, I died as mineral and became a plant. I died as plant and rose to animal. I died as animal and I was human. Why should I fear? When was I less by dying? Yet once more I shall die human to soar with angels, blessed above. And when I sacrifice my angel soul, I shall become what no mind ever conceived. As a human, I will die once more, reborn. I will with the angel soar. And when I let my angel body go, I shall be more than mortal mind can know. So that is essentially saying the same thing. What did you ever lose by dying? And that's, that was the point of Raghib at the end of the... Uh, of the book is that you know you were a nutfa and then Allah made you alaqa and then you became mudra and then you became uh, laham and ilam and each stage you were getting better so you weren't losing anything by dying from the previous thing and then you're made a human and then you're going to die so he's saying the 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 verse is very clear that each stage was better than the previous stage so death will be better the 
it's Allah's attribute of you know, al shahur the place where there's no bit of failure in this earth, where each stage is a whole better body and better and better and better. So the fact that the fact that, that process, you know, that that phenomena exists as it does is a proof of his his gratitude by virtue of it being a steady improvement and, and, and again a steady rarification and and it right. just gets and, better and better yeah and, better. and it's happening everywhere yeah. all the time alhamdulillah yeah so you mentioned that uh, death is essential for the completion of a uh, human potential and uh, that makes me wonder whether the fana that is granted to the great saints, right. whether that's also a form of death. I mean, it absolutely is, because they're perfected in this world. So, so the, uh, you know, I talked about that earlier, that the path of salvation, which is the majority of Muslims are on, is different from sanctification. So the path of sanctification involves a death here in this world, which is the, uh, the death of the ego. And, and that, that's a, th those are the, the kummal. The Prophet ﷺ said they're rare, those people, the kummal. And, and uh, that's al insan al kamal. So he's completed in this world. And those are, I mean, obviously all the prophets have that maqam. But then there's the awliya that, that, uh, that, uh, ha that have that maqam, right? I mean, all believers, you should consider every believer a wali of Allah. But there's degrees of wilaya, just like there's degrees of, of, uh, of wealth, degrees of intelligence, degrees of everything in the world. It's all degrees. So there's degrees of wilaya. And you don't know people's maqam. You don't know. You have to be very careful with people, even with non-Muslims. I mean, the Moroccans say, don't have any, because Allah hides his awliya in, in his creation. And, and, and you don't know, Omar was beloved to God when he was a, a, an idolater in Mecca. Because that's not who Omar was. Allah knew who Omar was. So Allah's, Allah doesn't change. Allah knew that Omar was a wali there and then. So you don't know where people, where people are at. Everybody's evolving. We're all evolving. The nat the nature or the temperament of them. So I was wondering, um, are we born with a, a specific temperament suited for our specific cap capacities or our teloi that is um, decreed for us? Or does it change based of our raising and our nurturing? I mean, uh, mizaj can change. So people have, like, in your life, children tend to be sanguine, then you move into choleric, and then you move into melancholic, and then you move into phlegmatic. So that's a natural progression in your life. So early stage, you know, children are happy. They should be happy. We want children to be happy. We're upset when they're not happy, right? Children should be happy. Um, and, uh, and so that's a sanguine personality. And then choleric is, is the drive, and that comes into youth and uh, you know, that early period of life where you're striving and working really hard. And then 40, it's, yeah, the melancholy starts setting in. That's why people, uh, people have those midlife crises and things happen to them at that stage. And then the later period, it's phlegmatic. You, tend to accept things, you don't get riled up about things, you've kind of seen a lot, and the, hopefully, I mean, that's, that's so, so mizaj can change um, in, in your life, but generally most people will have a type of baseline mizaj, and it could be murakab, so, you know, people have a, you know, they have their fundamental one, but then they have they can fall into a melancholic because of life experiences, things like that. So, but they'll still have those basic fundamental ones. Anyway, and that, that's the Mizaj theory. So, just to follow up on that, um, I was wondering, um, 
So what was the, what's the is there like a paradigmatic um, message that we want to achieve, like the Prophet? I mean, the perfect is balance of the four. Yeah, so the Prophet is perfectly balanced. He has all the positive qualities of, of the four temperaments and none of the negative qualities. Because he is the, a, an insan al So he, 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 he got upset when it was appropriate to get upset. Right? He was joyful when it was appropriate to be joyful. You know, he, 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 was, uh, he was calm and, and collected when that, when that was the appropriate response to a situation, you know, or, or got up and did something when that was the appropriate response. He always, in every situation, he, he responded appropriately, with rare exception, and the few times were done more for, as teaching. Like Abbasu wa Tawalla is an example where he was involved in a virtuous act, which was calling this wealthy man to Islam. But that wealthy man wasn't really that interested in hearing it, whereas the, the poor man was. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that it was better to be in that act. But that's rare that, you know, in, in the Prophet's, and that's more for us, you know, and also, you know, it's, it's a proof of his prophecy that, I mean, Aisha said about the ayah um, concerning Zayd, he said if the Prophet was going to conceal anything from the Qur'an, he would have concealed that, but he didn't conceal anything. He, the Prophet was a complete, transparent, open book. His life is the single most transparent pre-modern life that we have. Nobody knows more about a pre-modern person than we know about the Prophet once his revelation started. Prior to that, it's, 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 it's sketchy, his early period. I mean, we know the most important things, but, but there's a lot of details that, that aren't fleshed out in the seerah. But the hadith is amazing. And Aisha is, is one of the most important. I mean, she relates over 2,000 hadiths that deal with being with the Prophet so how he got up, how he showered, how, how, how he bathed, how he, all the things that he did. It's amazing to know all those things about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There you go. Any other? Any from online? Yeah, tafadlan. Uh, for the causes of disparity, it seems like he's listing them in order of the least voluntary to the most voluntary. But is there any other hikmah in that in, that, in the order? I mean, that he, he gives? definitely has. A, I, I agree. Like there is a logical order to how he presented them, and I didn't finish that. But we have a little time, so he does say something really important um, at, at the end of that uh, section that I didn't do. Um, so he says that. Um, So he says, Al Fadr at Tamar Fadila, Manishtamat Rahu Hadid Asbab and Musaida, who and Yakuna Tayyabatina, Mortadel and Amzija, Jari and Fi Asarabi Aba and Sulha, with the Wee Amanatin with Tikama, with Kawin and Minotfet and Tayyaba, Women Dami Tamthin Tayyab. على مقتضى الشرع ومرتضيا بدر طيب ومأخوذا من صغره إلى كبره من قبر مربيه بالآداب الصريحة وبالصيانة عن مصاحبة الشرار ومتخصصا بعد بلوغه بمذهب حق ومجهدا نفسه في تعرف الحق مسارعا إلى الخيرات فمن وفق في هذه الأشياء تتجمع فيه الخيرات من سائر الجهات كما قال تعالى ولو أنهم ولو أنهم أقاموا التوراة والإنجيل وما أنزل إليهم من ربهم لا أكروا من فوقهم ومن تحت أرجلهم. so 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 he says that the the virtuous one who has complete virtue is the one who has all of these. he got all of the 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 qualities. So he said he comes from a good, good source. He has a balanced uh, mizaj. He came from righteous p parents, ancestors, Abba Sulaha, people of, of trustworthiness and uprightness. He was 
composed of a good um, nutfa tayyiba, you know, like a, a pure zygote f- from good uh, uh, bl- bl- womb blood uh, and in accordance with the sharia uh, he was nursed with pure milk uh, and then from the time he was young until reaching maturity he had good caretakers who taught him uh, good adab and protected him from the company of foul people uh, and then once he achieved maturity he followed a true madhab and he exerted himself to know the truth, hastening to virtuous acts. So the one who has tawfiq, success, in all of these things, all of the good of this world, from all of its directions, has been completed in him. And it's, as Allah said, had they only been uh, uh, established the Torah and the gospel and what God revealed to them, they would have ate from uh, above them and from under their feet. And it would وَيَكُنُوا جِدِيرًا أَنْ يُعَدَّ مِمَّا وَصَوَ اللَّهُ تَعَلُوا إِنَّهُمْ عِنْدَ لَنَا مِنَ الْمُصْطَفَّيْنَ الْأَخْيَارِ And they are with us among those chosen uh, righteous ones. And then he says وَالرَّذِلَ التَّامَ الرَّذِيلَ And the, the, the vicious, complete in viciousness, is the one who has the opposite of all these things. Right? So, so they could have the opposite of all those things. And he said, so, uh, so, no, man tabat ahwaruhu, and tava bikulima simiahu, wa shahaduhu, in khairam, in sharran, woman khabutat ahwaruhu, wa stadarra, bikulima simiahu, wa shahaduhu, araha, the dalla law to ara, and bella the tayibu, yahrujan about to who, bid near abihi, while the khabutha la yahruju illa nekida. So he says that the one who, you know, his, his states are good, he will benefit from everything he hears, everything he sees, whether it's good or ill, he'll benefit. Whereas the one who has bad uh, circumstances, uh, he'll be harmed by everything he hears and everything he sees. And this is what Allah says, a good land brings forth a good foliage by the permission of its Lord and a foul one, nothing comes out of any good. What khabith min al-ard in taba bedruhu and bad soil, even if the seed is good and the water is good, it won't bring forth good fruit. Whereas good earth, even if the seed is not that good and the water is not that good, it will still bring forth what's good. So, so the, the earth has all these different places and different types of gardens with grapes and, and date palms and and uh, they're all fed from the same water, but we prefer some over others in, in, in what's produced and for the food. And surely is, in that is science for people who use their intellects. So, and those who, who believe uh, uh, the Quran is a guidance and a healing. And those who don't believe, their ears are plugged up and they're blind to it. And we reveal from this Quran what's a healing and a mercy for the believers. And it only increases the wrongdoers in, in more wrong. So, so, you know, we have to be, if, if, first of all, if you had two parents, that's a great blessing, just having two parents. A lot of people grow up with one parent. If you have two parents, it's a great blessing. If they were good parents, if they were harmonious, it's a great blessing, you know. Um, but just guidance itself, the fact that, that you're Muslim, alhamdulillah ala islam wa kafa biha ni'ma. Praise be to Allah for the blessing of Islam, and it suffices as a blessing. Even if you didn't have any of those things, if you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, Alhamdulillah, what a blessing. And that will save people. 
That, that's going to save people. Just la ilaha illallah. And that, Muhammad Rasulullah. And that's why Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, radiallahu anhu, uh, he talked about towards the end of time that there would be people, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned that towards the end of time, he said Islam would, would uh, yadrasu kama yadrus al thawb ala labisihi. Like, uh, Islam will be worn out like a robe gets worn out on, on, the, on the man who wears it. And he said, to the point where people, they won't know what prayer is, what fasting is. Uh, they'll say, they'll, they'll, they'll say, our ancestors used to say this, so we say it. But they won't know what it means. So al Hudayfa, who was kind of the expert on the end of time, he, um, he related this hadith. And uh, one of the tabi'in, he said, Qabbahahum Allah, wa ma yanfa'uhum. Like, you know, qabbahu, that, that's an Arab expression of like, I mean, literally it means, you know, may God make them ugly. You know, so, so he said, may God make them ugly. What will it benefit them? And Hudayfa looked at me and said, Qabbahak Allah anta. May God make you ugly. He said, Sayyundihim min an nar. It will save them from the fire. So don't underestimate the power of just la ilaha illallah. That's why making takfir of people is really, just leave that to the Qadis. <laughs> Who do you think you are? You're going to determine? You know? And that's not to say that there aren't limits to the Sharia, and it, we believe in those limits, but you know, you don't know people's conditions. I mean, one, one of, in, in Maliki Madhab, they actually address the fact that people that grow up in non Muslim lands are not held accountable for ma'lum min din darora. They're not held accountable for that because they don't know the deen. They didn't grow up in an environment where ma'lum min din darora, you know, people use that expression, it's known out of necessity by the religion, badihatan. You know, everybody knows it. That's if you grow up in a Muslim society. Everybody knows it. People here, they don't know it. People don't even know what a woman is anymore here. I mean, God help us. <laughs> That's how bad it is. So, you know, people are confused. So, so just go easy on people. That's my advice. You know, you can take it or leave it. If you like, took fear of me, I just say, subhanAllah. I know I'm a Muslim. I'm actually certain of it. I don't have any doubts. You know, I mean, the Ash'aris, they say you can say on a mu'min, inshallah. The Maturidis say you, you, you can't say that. Imam Maturidis madhab, you have to say it with certainty. You can't say on a mu'min, inshallah. The, the Ash'aris say it from the point of view is we don't know what our end is. You know, we ask Allah for husn or khatima. So they, they actually think that that your iman is based on the khatim. Whereas the maturi say, no, it's whatever you are in that moment. So you have to be certain of what you are. So you can't say on a mu'min, inshallah. You have to say on a mu'min, jazman. Yeah, you're, I'm definitely a Muslim. I'm, a, I'm definitely a believer. I believe in Allah. Amantu billah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanakum alhamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa tubu ilayk. Wal asri inna rinsana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amiru salihati wa tawasu bil haqqi wa tawasu bil sabar. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamu ala musirin. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah, wa salli lahum ala Sayyidina Muhammad. I hope uh, people that are online, uh, if you know, you, uh, continue to support the college. Thank you for whatever support you gave this Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, people, uh, we've been very blessed to have generous supporters. May Allah bless all of you, increase you, elevate you, accept our prayers. Allahumma taqabbal minna salatana wa qiyamana wa hashurna fi zumrati khayr al-anam. Allahumma ahyina mu'mineen wa amitna muslimin. ومتنا مسلمين محسنين طائعين لك يا رب العالمين لا مبدلين ولا مغيرين يا رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته